Hello, everyone, and welcome to a very, very special um, LSE Transfer Room stream, a podcast stream. Um, I've got Chris joining me today, and we've got a very, very, very special guest, and absolute pleasure to have him on, Clive Tilsley. 36 years of broadcasting, 36 memorable years, I'm, I'm sure. Um, how are you doing today, first, Clive? I'm, I'm only 28, and my dad was a commentator. <laughs> a lot of people make that confusion. Yeah, I, I, I've only started the last few years, yeah. You just took over. Just, identical, <laughs> identical people. Yeah, uh, but it, it, there's been so many, so many games that he's covered, and so many memories. We're going to go over a few Liverpool ones. We're going to go maybe, maybe cover international because there's been international games that he's covered. But we'll start from the beginning, Clive. Uh, ITV took you over first, and then you did a stint at BBC and back to ITV. Um, what was your favourite memory at, at the last thirty six years? Which period of, of football do you remember the most? Is it the recent ones or anything early on? Well, I, I, I mean, without sort of dropping into commentator cliche land straight away, I think if I learnt anything about being around the Liverpool team of, and the Liverpool club of the late 70s and early 80s, um, it was a lot of their very down-to-earth professional um, attitudes and approaches to the next game being the biggest, you know, even if it was home to Accrington Stanley in the third round of the League Cup and they were playing whoever, you know, Arsenal or Manchester United on the Saturday, the Liverpool focus was there from, from the beginning. And I suppose it, to, to that end, my next game is my most important. Of course it is. Um, and I enjoy the job as much as ever. But I started um, in local radio in Nottingham in straight from university in 1975. I uh, managed to, to get a kind of runner's job, T-boy job at a local station that was just um, opening. And the first break is always the biggest break. And I worked for 18 months around the Nottingham Forest team that were a mid-table championship side, uh, but were two or three years away from becoming champions of Europe. So... Um, Getting the move to, to Merseyside, to Radio City, in the spring of 77 um, was a step up. But but I couldn't have imagined at that moment the size of that step. And the greatest thing of all of, of about coming to Merseyside at that time and staying around Merseyside, because I, I went on to work for Granada TV and still lived on the Wirral, um, probably the greatest single thing was not the fact that Liverpool were weeks away from winning their first European Cup as I arrived and then dominating for the next 10 years. And then the, the only real threat to their dominance in the mid 80s was the team from across the park. All of that was just wonderful to be around. But I was the same age as the players. Mm. They were my mates. Uh, a lot of them still are. And it was a different relationship between football and its media then. Um, I'm not, you know, it's not something to be proud of, but we went for a beer afterwards, you know, we, we, yeah. more than more than one. You know, we went to the, the Continental in Liverpool off, on a Saturday night and I was with the players. Um, yeah, I played golf with the players. I knew their families. Um, and so... Do you wish it was still like that now? Yeah, I, 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 to a degree. I, I used to travel on the team coach to away games, stay in the hotel with them the Friday night before the game. That is, you know, I would get off the the the, the coach at the hotel and people would think I was one of the team. They, they would ask me for my autograph. They, I, they used to think I was Alan Hansen to begin with and then later Jan Mulby. Um, <laughs> I never signed any of them. <laughs> but um, that is how close I was to certainly the best club team in football at the time and and you know as we look back now and obviously we've just seen a team complete a treble you know what one of the greatest club size that I've ever seen including great is overused word in football but four or five truly great players and guys that I I can to this day call friends of mine and um so that 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 makes my period on Merseyside extra special going slightly before that clive when you were growing up and watching football 
there's there's a lot on uh, on Twitter that say that certain commentators support certain clubs. But what? Who were the team that you supported growing up? Oh, I was a huge Manchester United fan. Um, I'm I'm from yeah. Bury. Um, my dad was a United fan. Uh, I mean, my entry into the world is is a story in itself because um, the woman that went to the nursing home with my mum for, for my birth uh, was our next door neighbour, who was the wife of the Bury manager at the time. We lived in the same building. We're in a semi-detached house with the Bury manager. My uncle Dave was the manager of the local football club. I could walk to gig. Well, I couldn't walk then, uh, but I, I could be. I could be. I went to gig lane before I was born. My mum went to games when she was pregnant, so she was a Bury fan. But my dad was a United fan, and he took me from the age of five to, to watch United play. And all through my teens, I was home and away. United had a season in what's now the Championship. I missed about six games that season. And if you would have told me that I would ever have an affection for any other football club when I was 15, 16 years of age. I wouldn't have started a fight with you because I wasn't I wasn't that kind of fan. Um, but I got pretty angry. Um, but I think when I started to work, it was such a dream job for me. And to be inside track and, and that first 18 months around that Forest team, Brian Clough was the manager. So, you know, I was sort of wide-eyed, misty-eyed every single day. Guys like Martin O'Neill, you know, who is still a huge friend, became my first big friends in in football. And suddenly I was commentating on my mates and I was almost living with them and traveling, being down at the, the, the city ground and then later around Fitwell, Belfield and Melwood waiting for interviews. So I was just around these guys all the time. And the United thing just left me completely. Um, I, I, I no football fan would ever understand that. Um, but to this day, I mean, I can name drop with the best of them. But, you know, like Gareth Southgate was at our wedding. I, I mean, he my my pal is the England manager. So, of course, I want him to do well and his teams to do well. So um, it th- that just overtook me that just that just, I just being inside track, really. And just just knowing these guys, knowing knowing how much it meant to them. Um, to, to win football matches and to, to wear the shirt, um, whether it was Liverpool or Everton. And I I, I actually I, I did a book a couple of years ago and I, I said that to this day, the biggest game I've ever covered, I remember I commentated on an England World Cup semi-final, 30 million people. Uh, but the biggest game I've ever covered was the 1986 FA Cup final because... At the time, Liverpool were playing Everton. Liverpool had, had won the league the, 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 the weekend before. The double had, had never been done by a Merseyside club. Uh, Everton had pushed them all season. And it was it, it was kind of the derby to end all derbies. We'd, we'd know, we didn't think there could ever be a bigger game uh, than this. And I commentated on it, not to many people. Not many people would have followed it on Radio City that afternoon. They'd have watched it on BBC and ITV. But what made it massive for me, I knew everybody on the field personally. I knew how big this game was to each of them. And it's a funny story. Um, that there was a nightclub in Birkenhead that I used to go to. And it was owned uh, by a guy who knew Peter Stringfellow really well. And at the time, Stringfellows, which is now kind of a lap dancing club, really, was the nightclub in London. And Stringfellow was the nightclub owner in the UK. And he'd asked his mate if there was any way he could guarantee having the FA Cup in Stringfellows that Saturday night. So I negotiated with both camps. <clears throat> I said, look, there's an, if you win, there's an open invitation to go to Stringfellows, but you've got to take the cup with you. And that afternoon at, at Wembley, which was an extraordinary afternoon, the game was incredible, and Liverpool came from behind to win it. And as they left the stadium, I checked with Craig Johnston and Jan Mulby that they were going to Stringfellows. I said, yeah, we're going to go. We've got a dinner and everything back at the hotel. And then we're going on to Stringfellows. And they said, are you coming? I said, no, no. And I didn't tell them where I was going. I went to the Everton banquet that night at the Royal Garden Hotel. And I was invited to both, um, which is extraordinary, really privileged for somebody in, in my position. But I just felt I hadn't won the cup. I had mates who had won the cup, but I had mates who'd lost the cup final and lost the league the week before. I felt I needed to be with them. I, I felt that I needed those, those drinks I was going to have that Saturday night 
I wanted to have with my pals in, in the Everton dressing room. I just felt I should be around them rather than, you know, celebrating with, with the, with the Liverpool players. So I went, I went to the Everton bank and I was on top of the open top bus with the Liverpool guys the next day. Um, and the number of Evertonians who came out that day and applauded them. I mean, I, it almost brings tears to my eyes just thinking about it. It's a fantastic feeling then. It was kind of, it, we're talking about an era when, you know, uh, Merseyside w- had almost been cut off from the rest of the country by the Thatcher government. And there was a very left-wing sort of local um, uh, government in in uh, on Merseyside. Um, the Toxeth riots were around. Well, I mean, they weren't just in Toxeth, but elsewhere in the country. But there were a lot of things happening around the, the newsroom that I was working in at, at Radio City in Liverpool. But it was a bit of us against the world. And and that first League Cup final, when, when they met um, uh, at, um, at, at Wembley uh, in that goalless League Cup final, th- there was a moment five minutes from the end when the whole stadium, the whole of the Wembley stadium, started to sing Merseyside together. And, you know, those things, uh, that was a really special time to be living on Merseyside, working on Merseyside. And as I say, what made it even more special was that I knew some of the most famous footballers in the world. They were my mates. So when you go back to Merseyside now then, Clive, do you feel at home? I, I, I For a mank, I think I do, yeah. <laughs> uh, which is pretty extraordinary. Um, I, I have said, and I, th- I think I've said it publicly before, it's the best and worst city in the world. Um, <laughs> there are elements about it which I, I'll never get my head around because I'm not from there. Um, but there are... I, I, you know, st- stereotypes are terrible in my business, full stop. And it, and it's, it would sound a little bit crass for me to say they are amongst the warmest people in the world uh, because they're amongst the edgiest <laughs> times. <Yeah. laughs> and they'll put you down very, very quickly. Um, you know, there's a famous uh, story, and I don't think I'm telling too many tales out of school, and you wouldn't be too surprised about this, about Richard Keyes and Andy Gray and their sky pomp trying to walk through the front door at Anfield without their passes on and the guy stopping them and I mean obviously they were household names and faces in in English football at the time and uh, you can imagine the conversation you know Keyes said I'm Richard Keyes and I don't give the fuck are you are where's your back <laughs> <laughs> and I would never ever have tried that I, 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 I'd I lived there long enough to know there are certain mm. things that you do not do. And and that is it's to do, not to do with Merseyside particularly, it's to do with standards and respect yeah. for people. Yeah. This guy's doing his job. You know, his job is to stop people coming in who shouldn't be there. Just get your damn badge on. It's not a big deal. Mm. Um, but if you, if you show a Scouser respect, generally speaking, you'll get it back. If you show them disrespect, you'll hear about it. I love that. <laughs> I think that I think that's the best part of life, though, isn't it, Clive? That's that's human beings, and that's it puts things in perspective a little bit, doesn't it's it? It's a very human city. And, when, and, it's, when, you know, when you, uh, you talk uh, about going uh, to United, and then you, you well, I think going to a city like that, and you become you love it like that. You love it like a home, like you said. Yeah, and it shows you what kind of place it is and what kind of people are around there. Yeah, and what happened in Sheffield and Brussels has has made the football club more human. I, I've always I've always said it's a slightly melodramatic football club, and it was before Highland, before Hillsborough. You know, I mean, just there are the, the just the nature of the flags that are paraded on the cop before a big game, the the hours and care and love that has gone into the embroidery to create those images. There is such a pride in how that looks. And we used to have a, a silly thing, you know, when ITV had Champions League and we the only station that had Champions League, we had to take, we came on air at 7.30 for a 7.45 kickoff and we had to take two commercial breaks. And um, so in almost inevitably, one of them interrupted the singing of You'll Never Walk Alone to the point where we almost tried to take the break before it started. Um, so we didn't see any of it because it was so such a sensitive thing for Liverpool fans. It was like interrupting the national anthem. It's not the national anthem. It's I'm sorry. It's just a football song, but it's far more than that. As part of the ritual of going, you don't take your seat at Anfield a minute before kickoff. 
you take your seat at Anfield 15 minutes before kickoff. Every fan knows that because you want to see this unique build-up to the start of a football occasion, which you which you get at, at that stadium. And I mean, in fairness, Celtic Park's not that dissimilar. Um, it's pretty impressive there. The scarves go up and so on and so forth. But it's Liverpool's song. It's Jerry's. It's not. It's not a Jerry and the Pacemaker song. It's an old American show tune. But Jerry sang it and made the hit. And I met him. I knew him. You know. I mean, all of that stuff. And some of those archive pictures of, of the cop in the sixties. There's a very famous panorama program where the guys are singing a Silla Black song, you know, and it's nearly all men. It's nearly all white men. Let's face it that, you know, that's where football was in the mid sixties. Um, but to be singing this Silla Black love song, but with pride in the Mersey sound and that, and so it was a melodramatic football club and Shanks got that. Bill came and saw that, saw this is different and, and, and somehow harnessed it and, amplified it and and made you know, the red shirts and the this is Anfield sign the most brilliant they talk about football psychology today he, he was the first football psychologist he he knew that this was a different city and therefore a different football club and that connection between the football club and the city is really really strong and a lot of those guys a lot of the scouts that play for Liverpool were Evertonians you know Caro most famously but there are others too Robbie was and um, Roshi was an Evertonian um, but to have Trent in the team to have Curtis now back in the team it's more important at Liverpool than it is I think nearly anywhere else I think it, it, it okay it's a very international football club and the uh, you know, it's one of the Evertonian taunts, is it? The kind of sort of Scandinavian, uh, the, the, you know, the number of Irish and Scandinavian. Oh, cool, that's fine. I'm sorry. It's a worldwide brand. That's what you get with a worldwide brand. But most Liverpool fans are Scousers. I mean, you know, most, most Liverpool fans are Scousers. And to see a couple of Scousers in the team just keeps that connection. And, you know, way back um, the era that I was sort of first came into the football club, that Liverpool had a very famous administrator, a guy called Peter Robinson, who was his title was secretary, club secretary, but he was the chief executive, really. Nothing. He did all the contracts. He, he, I think he oversaw an awful lot of the recruitment, which was incredible in the 70s and 80s. Uh, but uh, Peter, the, Liverpool were one of the, the last of the big clubs to really uh, embrace like commercialism, you know, the, the executive boxes, the glass fronted executive boxes. He didn't want those. He didn't think they belonged at Anfield. They had them at Old Trafford and he didn't want that separation between anybody who'd paid a bit more money and the guy who, who, who you know, bought the cheapest concession seat in the stadium. And, and that, I, I think, you know, mercifully with the arrival of Jurgen Klopp, who, who rather like Bill Shackley, just got it from day one got what this football club was like. By the way, Roy Hodgson is the most wonderful man. And we can see now what a good football coach he is. But he didn't get it. It just, it just Roy is a, just a different kind of guy. He's a, You'd love his company and you'd love his passion for football, but he didn't connect with Liverpool. Klopp has connected with Liverpool in a way that, um, that Shanks did. And you need that connection between, even when you're European champions, even when you're league champions, even when you're world champions, you still need Liverpool players need to understand the connection with the football club and with the city. And it, it is pretty much unique in my experience. This is a strange black spot, which is, uh, this is just, it's all right. it's fine. I, 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 this is not a horror movie, folks. On my face. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I mean, you, you said obviously Liverpool, very, very warm, welcoming people. Um, I think you'd be, very much warmed and welcomed. Uh, so they can com- be. <laughs> <laughs> warmed and welcome for your commentary on the 2005 Champions League final. I mean, we couldn't do a podcast with you, Clive, without talking about this. Um, I want to just talk about t- sort of run into it, first of all. Uh, Liverpool were complete underdogs in in this situation. It had to scrape through in the last six, uh, to, from the group stage to get through. Um, what was the feeling um, for, around you and at ITV about Liverpool and their run to the, to the Champions League final in Istanbul? Well, I think uh, the, the, you're going to hate me for, for doing this, but I think there are parallels between Liverpool 05 and Manchester United 99. Uh, not, yeah, I mean, obviously Manchester United won the title and 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 and, the, uh, and 
you know, did the treble and they were the best football team in the country at the time. Liverpool were not. Um, you know, they will finish fifth in 05, something yeah, like yeah. that. And and you do look at that team. Now, I, I think they played better against Milan two years later and lost. I think it was a better performance. Yeah. And Caro would tell you exactly the same thing. It was, um, so they were an underdog. And obviously, Stevie's goal, the, the three goals, I, it's a good quiz question, you know, who scored the other two? Um, was it Cinema Pongol and Neil Mellor? Was it no. scored the Schmitz, other two? Schmitz, I mean, the, uh, and uh, along the line. Line. Oh, no, in the in the comeback in the oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah Cinema um, definitely won. So, and then the ghost yeah. goal, and um, I mean, even the quarter final was very, very traumatic. You know, Sammy scored a goal which he'll never score again <laughs> before or since. <laughs> yeah, uh, Luis Garcia. I mean, that, that was, and so there was a little bit of that. I mean, again, going back to, I'll, I'll only mention it once more. Um, when United equalised against Bayern, I gave myself some thinking time, and I said, "Then I said, name on the trophy." I, yeah, yeah, forget it. This has just been written months ago. This they're going to win it, um, and there was a bit of that with Liverpool, really. Um, and, and you just it, for them to be three down and going on thirty-three at half time, and the third Milan goal was such a thing of beauty. That I did spend half time um, researching, looking through my facts of record defeats and all that sort of stuff. And and I remember Andy Townsend, who was with me, being really angry that he hadn't played Didi and he played Kuhl. And I, and they just thought they'd blown the chance here. They're, they're going to get you know wiped away. And of course, we now know to this day, they, with, through Guillaume Balaguer's book, the extraordinary scenes in the dressing room, which were nothing l- like the picture that's been painted you know Rafa uh, gave one team talk with 10 counters on the board and one with 12 on the board there's total mayhem um Stephen uh, Traore was, uh, was in the shower and had to come back out get dry and put his kit back on because Stevie Finnan wasn't well he thought he was fit so Stevie Finnan's is going mad because he wants to carry on playing they said no you're coming off Harman's already gone out to warm up he didn't know what's going on he doesn't even know which other 10 players are joining him on the field Total chaos. Three goals in seven minutes. <laughs> yeah. How do you win a How do you win a, a, a Champions League final? To be a player, well. pandemonium in the dressing room at half time. You don't really know what you're doing, but you've got Steven Gerrard on the field. And I mean, Stevie's performance that night. Caro was fantastic, um, but Stevie played in three different positions. He played it right back for about twenty minutes. Um, he was amazing that night. Absolutely amazing. And he is. I it, when you play that game when you're as old as me and you can play the game of the greatest Liverpool eleven of all time, which is a stupid game to play, really, uh, because you had no idea whether Billy Little belongs in it, for one thing. Um, but I would always say that Gerard is... Because Dalglish had Hansen and Sooners and Clemens, um, you know, Sooners had Dalglish and Rush, and uh, uh, Stevie didn't. He didn't have those players. He had Vladimir Smitser, he had Jimmy Traore, he had those players, Steve Finnan, he had Jertseed, and, and that's that's the team that he played. Well, why didn't he win the league? That's why he didn't win the league. Um, but he was... get, it, get it written down, get it written down there, Clive. That's going to go up in the, in folklore history, what you just said. I, 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 don't want to, I don't want to name who I think is Liverpool's greatest player. And there, by the way, there's some new candidates now. Um, because... I don't think the I don't think Liverpool have made better signings than Allison and Van Dijk, uh, and and they paid you know top dollar for those two guys, but in terms of the impact that those two men have made on what's happened since, with both with their ability and with their personalities, and again how they got Liverpool Football Club, you could have paid twice as much for both of them, and it would they'd still be bargains, but it, they got. Salah in their team, you know, and 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 Mane and Firmino and you know all the 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 players that we've seen over the last few years that have gelled together. Stevie didn't have those, and I I think if if somebody put me up against a wall and put a gun to my head and said, "No, oh, you're going to have to name your greatest ever Liverpool player that you've seen," I can't talk about little. I don't know. Um, I'd be very tempted to go, Stevie G. In terms of Steven Gerrard, then, do you think he overachieved with the team that he had? Because, I mean, we were in title races at times, like 2001 with Arsenal, 
you know, went again with Man United later on in, uh, after the Champions League final. But it was it 2008, I think, we Man United. Got very close. You know, we got into Champions League finals twice. We, got, we won one. We won the FA Cup. Known as the FA Cup final, the Stephen Gerrard final, as we remembered. And it, it won quite a bit to say the team that he had and the challenge. Did this, Would you say he overachieved with the team that he had? Well, I think, you know, I think that the, 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 the Rogers team that very nearly won the title, I mean, Torres and Suarez were, were up there with him. Chabi was up there with him. Cara, as as for what Cara was, he was as good as anything around. Uh, Pepe Reina came in and made a difference. Um, so, um, you know, I've, obviously I've, I've seen bits of Liverpool teams. Since, uh, it's very difficult for me because the team that I watched in the late 70s and early 80s was pretty much complete. Um it, it was just such a beautifully balanced football team. Um, and obviously the, the, the legends have grown from it. Um, but actually, if you came and watched that team play once, you wouldn't have gone away saying, well, Doug Leach makes all the difference there because there were other players always making a difference and they made collectively less so with, the, the Barnes Beardsley team because the the, the the individuals there and Rushy's goals that the individuals started to make an impact. But you know the the team of the Rushy didn't really come into his own until eighty two, eighty three. Yeah, it was David Johnson, David Fairclough and Stevie Highway were the you know were the kind of main forwards um in that team that first took shape. The um, with with Clem and and then uh, Clem was a huge loss to me as a person. I mean, a very very close friend, wonderful wonderful man. And cro- great talk about the greatest Liverpool player. The greatest Liverpool man I've ever met is Ray Clemens. Uh, he fought cancer for decades and and with a smile on his face. And but but a product of that Liverpool culture you know that you he's not obviously not a scouser but he, he came at quite a young age and he lived like a liverpool man and uh he was just an absolute joy to be around but as i say they were all there together um and you wouldn't really have picked a star out of that team stevie was man of the match most weeks um when he played played for liverpool and um it i, I know him pretty well to this day um He's amazing. He is so damn competitive. Just when you think you've got a friendly conversation, messaging conversation going with him about something and nothing, you'll get this really uh, sharp, abrupt question will come back at you, like there's some stranger who's contacted him on a cold call. Uh, what do you mean by that? <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> he is that. He's got that real edge about him. And um, I spend a bit of time around him in a managerial capacity because I did some work for Rangers Television whatever, to when, when they had their invincible season. And um, he w- just was so accommodating and so lovely to me until about one o'clock on Saturday. And then he was a totally different individual. It got, I just got this game face on. I got I could get nothing out of him then. And he, I, this is the guy, he, he was, he'd often on a Friday just p- literally get in the car and jump back and go go down and see Alex and the kids in Formby and, and then drive back on Saturday morning for a three o'clock kickoff. Um, just to try to keep the sanity of of his life going. So I would speak to him quite regularly on a Saturday morning on the A74, and he'd give me chapter and verse on his team. And then I'd pop down to see him at quarter past one. And it was like we hadn't had the conversation. That Again, that edge, what makes these guys different, what makes them special, just how much they want to win. And, and in the 21st century, you get a little bit of, you know, because they get paid a lot of money and stuff and fans – Maybe feel a little disconnected now from their heroes. You're not going. You're not going to bump into Stevie in Sainsbury's. You know, back in the day, you'd have probably bumped into Roger Hunt and Ian St John in whatever in the supermarket. That's not going to happen today. Um, so there is that a bit of disconnection. And somehow I've got to convey as somebody who actually knows these guys and know how badly they take defeat, how much they care, how much they want to win. And yeah, they have crap days like everybody else does, like I do. Um, but it's not through the want of trying and caring. And that's sometimes the message I've got to try to convey with the privilege of, of having their trust and their audience to, to, 
to tell fans, yeah, I know you're feeling bad, but believe me, they're feeling worse. Steven Gerrard, the manager, what do you think the future lies for him? Because, of course, had a greatly successful spell at Rangers. Um, didn't quite work out for him at Astava. Now he's made the move over to Saudi Arabia. Um, what does that the future lie for him? Because obviously that, some may say, say is a backward step. I don't know is the, is the simple answer. And I wouldn't dare to speak for him because of the character I've just um, <laughs> painted. I mean, it's not for me to say. It's for him to make the decisions. Yeah. I think, you know, again, without speaking out of school, all I've said to him as a friend is, is Stephen Gerrard. You know, don't take any, don't do anything that you don't have to do. You, you're Stephen Gerrard. You, the, the, you, you are an immense figure in, in our game. And, um, but he, he, he wants to work. He wants to, he's a football man. You know, that's what he talks about. He's not just somebody who switches on when he's at work. He 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 wants to work and he wants to show that he can coach. Um, and he'll yeah, and he'll take that opportunity, um, and he'll give it everything he's got. And uh, you wish him well. I mean, it, it you know the science of football is for me a bit of an anomaly. I mean, uh, there is so much data and so much information now around football, but the ball still bounces off knees and goes in off shoulders and and games are decided like that yeah yes by referees and, and but and by the greatest player in the world making a stupid mistake we're human and it's a very human game and um i it, you know we we judge coaches by uh parameters which they they shouldn't be judged by because it is to, to a degree a game of chance you know you see you used to see rafa on on the touchline trying to move a player six inches. Yeah, okay, Rafa. But it really, it's just, that's just your frustration. That's not what's going to win and lose this game. Um, you talked about Istanbul. I mean, you can't analyse that football match. It's like it's not like Liverpool scored three goals in seven minutes and then dominated the rest of the match. They didn't. Milan yeah. kind of carried on dominating the match. Uh, and, you know, Josie's made a save. He's got no idea how he made that at all to this day, but he made it. And... Um, and, and and almost like that gathering feeling of fate, you could see on Shevchenko's face when he walked forward, that, this, I don't want to be here. I'm not going to score this. They're going to win it. <laughs> it's, it acceptance. It, it, acceptance, wasn't it? It was acceptance. It's human. It's, it, yeah. You can have the greatest mentality in the world. But, the, and I've talked to footballers about this, that the, the sinking feeling in your heart and your legs when you've been two up and suddenly somebody's equalised, they've caught from nowhere, from a corner and a deflated free kick. And you're thinking, we're going to lose this. We, we were, you know, we had the cigars out five minutes ago. We're going to lose this football match. It's very difficult to fight back against that. And, um, you know, I think that was, that must have become Milan's challenge that night. I mean, they must have kicked off there for the third time in the second half thinking, how on earth has this yeah. happened? Where did this come from? You know, they've even missed the penalty and it's, it's bounced back to him and it's gone in. <laughs> I mean, what do we have to do to win this football match? Well, we'll get our back, heads back together again and we'll create some chances and Chevrolet will score. How did he make that say? No, no, we're not going to win. We're not going to win tonight. <laughs> and all the time, Cara and Stevie are thinking, we're going to win this damn thing, you know? And, and it, it's, I, I think you, you, you feel it in whatever level you play. Um, it just goes out of you. It, it just drains out of you, and it and it it's not just a mental thing. Physically, it's gone. You can't run anymore because you know it's not happening. And um, and then the, what do we do at the end of that night? We sack the manager <laughs> who, yeah. who hasn't kicked a ball. <laughs> <laughs> it, it just goes to show that stats only go so far, as well, doesn't it, Clive? I mean, people talk about stats these days and look at how many how many distances run and things like that. Mentality and physicality is so we used to get a, we, used to, we used to get a, a stat board at half-time in the Champions League when we were on a break. And completed passes, it, it's always the two centre-backs who are top. Yep. Well, they don't count. I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, the, uh, if they're not pressing me, I can definitely do it. I, I can do I that. I think any of us would be in the city team doing what John Stones is doing right now. 
Well, I, I, <clears throat> I mean, I've got I've got a bit of a thing about these inverted defenders. Um, you don't want me to talk about John Stones for five minutes. Uh, he's doing very well for a centre back, I think, in midfield. He definitely is. But does he does he create like De Bruyne or Gundogan? And that's my problem with with Trent, I, 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 who is not a problem in so much that all the evidence we saw in the closing weeks of last season is that you want him on the ball. And I've long, listen, I've never coached a football team of note in my life. So, I, and I qualify everything I'm about to say that, but I, I've always had this feeling he's an eight. That That's what he is. Don't make him defend. It, 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 it hasn't, some, some people just, kind of sense danger and 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 want to sense danger want to defend some don't but he needs to be in the football team and Gareth Southgate has always seen that I I know that because I've spoken to him about it and he tried it you remember two years ago uh, um, because he wanted this guy in his team but he didn't in the way he couldn't he couldn't play him at right back in the way that Liverpool do because he didn't have Virgil van Dijk and it, you know he didn't have that kind of cover. He didn't. He didn't have a team with the shape where you could give Trent that license. So, and he did have, in fairness, decent right backs. So, and Trent actually didn't play very well for England either. So, much, all this stuff about our oh, Southgate doesn't rate. He did. He really does rate him, and you can see that now. But he didn't want to play him there, so he tried him, and it didn't work. It didn't work because it's the first time in years and years and years that Trent's position on the field was suddenly different he's more in field he's got more happening behind him than he's ha he has at right back and so on so and he wasn't he wasn't arriving at the same time going forward that so but you don't abandon it because of that you 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 yeah, that's not the end of the experiment and you know what we're seeing now is and again I'm not a coach but where Trent played at the end of last season, he's still a, he's still the Liverpool right back when you lose the ball. I want to take that off him. I, I want to take that responsibility away from him because he is the most creative player in the Liverpool team. He can be in the England team. I actually wrote wildly three months ago, and I think Bellingham is sensational. I think he is a difference maker. But in the same sentence I wrote, is there anything that Jude Bellingham can do that Trent can't? Well, there probably are one or two things he would do better. But there are one or two things that Trent would do better than him. And actually, for all the disappointment, and, and I think there was a bit of a feeling amongst Liverpool fans, we might just nick Bellingham. You know, the, that friendship with Hendo seemed to, you know, a bit of a bit of bro, bro love going on there and stuff. And on you come. And, but... 100 mil. We can't, Liverpool can't do that. They, can, they can't do that. It's, they're not. Not. They, they could probably do it. They did it almost for Allison and Van Dijk because they needed. They desperately, desperately need. They don't. They don't need that midfield. And one of the reasons they don't need that midfield for me is I think Trent can play there. And Hendo is has been fantastic for Liverpool on and off the field. Just wonderful, wonderful man. And a wonderful captain to follow Stevie G with that armband and, and affect games in the way that he has them and affect attitudes um, in the dressing room and affect the, the, the almost the affection for the club. I think people I think outsiders see Jordan Henderson and see, you know, somebody who looks like he's he's been at Liverpool since the age of six. But it, it, it we know from how much he's rested that there must be a certain number of physical issues with playing him for 90 minutes week in, week out. I think that the sorcerer has got his apprentice there. I, I, that's where I just want to take all the as many defensive responsibilities away from Trent as I can, and just let him go. Um, do you build around Trent then, Clyde? Do you build around Trent? Do you think Southgate should build around Trent and Klopp? Uh, yeah, I, I don't want to start talking taxes because I, I, I'm going to say it for the third time, and I hope you don't edit that. I'm not a coach. <laughs> and, and I, I absolutely Love adore you. the idea of Jurgen Klopp being the manager of Liverpool Football Club. I'm not trying to argue against him. But in my very relatively humble opinion, he has wasted the last two years of Trent's development. Uh, and listen, Trent's won what he's won in the last one, well, you know, not that long ago. 
He's pl certainly played in a Champions League final uh, that Liverpool couldn't, should, maybe should have won in Paris last year. Um, so it's not like he's, he's letting you down every week, but I think you can get more out of him. I think there's been a certain amount of stubbornness to, no, no, we're going to do that with him. Um, <laughs> we're going to make this work. It's worked before. We're going to make it work. And it was great to see that stubbornness erode a little at the end of last season um, and see him playing as this sort of six stroke two. But I want to take the six and the two and add them up. Go. Yeah. <laughs> because, yeah. what, what, OK, it's only Malta. But he... I thought he started to look a little laboured in his running last year. I, I just thought, I started to think, are you still the athlete I think you are? Well, he was going past people in that England. He, he can do that. He, his left foot is sensational. Um, it, 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 so, yeah, I, I can see the still see the argument for getting him on the ball. And again, I'm not a coach, but maybe a double pivot, maybe a 4-2-3-1. Yeah, I can see that with Fab or somebody like Fab. Bicetic is got a chance, I think, in that role coming forward. Um, maybe McAllister is a 10, you know, with the, the Liverpool have had a few players who we thought actually, maybe Jota's a 10, who knows? Um, uh, maybe uh, Gakpo's a 10. And so I can see that. I, I, I can see that. But please, buy a right back. <laughs> <laughs> buy a right back and make it clear to, to yourself, to Trent, to everybody else, it, the, it, number 66 now plays in midfield. So, yeah, it's uh, it's certainly an interesting one going forward. Um, we've seen obviously Joshua Kimmich made a very similar move for Bayern Munich as well because they needed to get him on the ball because he's what a talented footballer he is. Um, but moving Trent, forward for Liverpool as well, him. oh, he Trent is, he is absolutely, absolutely. But yeah, moving forward for Liverpool, it's, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, again, going back to somebody you all hate, he's De Bruyne, yeah, he really is. Mm. The, the, I, I mean, De Bruyne is fabulous. But with a couple of years, if, if he'd had the last couple of years as a midfield player, is there anything Trent can do that, 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 that anything De Bruyne can do that Trent? I don't think there is. He's got it, mate. He's got it. Where do you think Liverpool will go next season? Obviously, it's a frustrating season, this one, uh, finishing in fifth place. There was a massive improvement, 11 games unbeaten um, at the end of the season. Um, so where do you think Liverpool need to go? Well, you've already set, suggested a, a move in the transfer market, but um, where, did, where did Liverpool need to go next season? And what would you consider a successful season for Liverpool next season? I think that, I, I think it's impossible to underestimate the physical and mental hangover from how far they went the season before. And I made a point of saying this during my Champions League commentary, that, that you know, the treble. Um, Liverpool went bloody close to the treble last year. You know, City were two down to Villa. Uh, OK, Liverpool weren't winning at the time, but they would have won that game. They'd have found a way to win it. City were in big trouble on, on that final day of the league season. And I think Liverpool were the better side in Paris. I think the goalkeepers made two sensational saves. I think if Liverpool scored the first goal, they win. They win the Champions League. I think they played well enough. Yet sometimes, you know, the benefit of hindsight, or oh, well, they lost the game, Real Madrid, you know, that that's what they've done all season. Yeah, OK. And Real Madrid did get away with a lot on the way to Paris. But... I thought Liverpool played well enough to win the game that night. And and, uh, and I thought it was a good performance in a huge game. And so uh, to come away from that with only the FA Cup and the League Cup and penalty shootouts, and mm. it, it was, they put a lot in. And, and I think, I funny enough, did the opening game of the season at Fulham, who were surprisingly good on the day. Uh, and of course, Liverpool had won the Community Shield in brilliant style the, the week before. Um, they kind of got outrun that day at, at Craven Cottage. And Liverpool never get outrun. That, one thing we know is, um, and one thing those stats, those dreaded stats have told us, Liverpool didn't run as much last season. And it's not because they didn't want to. It's because I, I just think that mm. they've come a long way and it was difficult. And, and unless you get the momentum, that, that little bit of kind of feeling that fate's with you, maybe they felt fate had gone against them a bit. And I think, it just it, it it was stop start wasn't it every time there was a the, um there was a kind of a, a fresh dawn a performance and there were several weren't there on the way through bidding city but it, they couldn't follow it up they lost Shotter and diaz i think but th these are just my opinions i think actually the attack looks fine um 
I don't think Mo had quite as good a season as some people do, um, but he's still Mohamed Salah. I like Gakpo. I'm not quite sure what he is or where he fits yet, but I think he's fine. Um, Jota and Diaz are back um, and, and will and are really, really, really good players. And Darwin Nunes is still a work in progress, but if, if you know... Is that science? If, if, in a year's time, we're talking about his 30-goal season. It wouldn't actually surprise me. I think there's something there. So I think I'm um, with McAllister now. Um, I think going for it, what, what frightened me about Liverpool last season was that I just think they always looked like conceding. And, and when they had a setback in a game, it, there was it, there was a kind of a, a feeling that this is going to go wrong, which, which the Liverpool team of the same players of the last three, four years, whenever they had a setback, you felt they'll be fine. I didn't feel that last season. I felt that they reacted badly to bad moments in games. There were several games they started well and then conceded the first goal and suddenly it started to come apart, the seams. And um, I, so uh, uh, Virgil is still Virgil. I think, seriously, I do think that three years ago there was a strong argument to say he was the best footballer in the world. Um, it, it's difficult to compare a centre back, the goalkeeper, with a centre forward. But in his position, there was nobody close to him. I, I, and I just felt that it, uh, the injury clearly has had an effect on him. Um, but he's still Virgil, and he'll still be fine. I, if, if I had a criticism of him, and what right have I got? I think he's a bit too cool for school sometimes. Mm. Uh, winning like games is difficult, Virgin. Uh, winning football matches is really difficult. It's okay to make it look difficult. You know? <laughs> Even though you are Virgil and you are the best defender in the world, it, some games will be difficult and it's okay. It's, that's all right to sweat a bit and get your knees dirty and get ruffled a bit. But yeah, please, it's fine. It's okay. You don't have to make it look like it's coming easy to you. It's not. We know that. So don't try. Um and, and that assurance that he and Ali give, because Ali is still the best goalkeeper in the Premier League. So I, I quite like Canate, um, but I, I'd also quite like to see another one. I'd like to see a lefty um, in there, a proper defender, you know, a Bastoni or somebody. Um, I think that would be kind of quite a key signing for me because of what I've said about Trent. I'd love to see a proper right back come in. Uh, I'd love it to be Joe. Go I'd love either of those to be Joe. Is it going to happen? I, 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 I've always I just the last few years just had a huge soft spot for Joe Gomez and Alex Oxlade Chamberlain because of the misfortune they've had. They're not injury prone. They just get injuries. It's not like it's the same recurring injury with them. They just got really, really unlucky, both of them. And I'm not sure. Robbo is. Yeah, I, I I'm. Absolutely cool with Robbo. Um, but at some stage further down the line, they're going to have to find the next Robbo. And I, I don't think it's the Greek Scouser personally. Um, so I, I'd kind of quite like to see a bit of reinforcement there, really. I don't know about Calvin Ramsey. We, we, none of us really know about Calvin Ramsey. Don't quite know what we're getting there. I, um, Fab didn't have a great season. Um, maybe he's the centre-back. I don't know. I I think there's a lot to think about there, but I actually kind of look quite like the other end of the field. I think, I, I'm not quite sure how they line up. Uh, I don't sure what Liverpool's best front three or front four is, but I think there are enough options there to find a good front four. And um, so I'm, I think they'll score goals next season. I, I They're just going to get mean again. Yeah. And it's, that's... Uh... That... That comes in midfield, I think, personally, Clive, because the lack of legs at the moment we've got and the lack of energy and just, the, like you said, mean. We ain't got a mean player anymore in, in midfield. We had Henson. The Henson's lost his legs a little bit. And Fabinho's, Fabinho's drop well. off this season was surprising for me. Henson has a lot of really good games. A lot of really, really good games. And you not absolutely know that whatever he's got, he's giving for you. No. So, yeah, he, yeah. We're not, nobody's binning anybody. And Cater didn't work out. Ox, for the mm. different reason, didn't work out. I I, like, I think Thiago's a really good footballer. I just don't think he's a Liverpool footballer. I never have done. I, 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 we all have these little blind spots in, you know, I've spent the last 
whatever, 12 years telling Manchester United fans that De Gea is not a good goalkeeper, but he's been their player of the year six times. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> I, I kind of I like goalkeepers who stop the ball with their hands rather than their shins. And I've always had this thing about... So, And I've got a bit of a thing about Thiago slowing Liverpool down. I liked the Liverpool model of the three midfield players who ran and ran and ran. They gave you more than that. Genie gave you more than that. Jordan gave you more than that. Emery Chan gave you more than that. They've, really, they've had some really good players, but, but Millie gave you more than that. But actually, that model of a front three that can almost look after themselves and win games on themselves, two full-backs who are almost front players, um, and then the best goalkeeper, the best player in the world, another centre-back, and then three guys who will just press and harass and run and run and grind you down. I like that model and I like it to this day. And Thiago isn't that. It's quite old fashioned, isn't it? Is that, is that, you know, it's quite old fashioned, that proper English get stuck in sort of, you know, a Stephen Gerrard as, as it were, I think. And I get that, I get that completely. And it's, it's that, it's always been like that at Liverpool throughout the, I'm sure you've seen it for the decades that, Hard work and that resilience. Yeah, and there were that, times that when he went, he, he kind of went Milner, Henderson, Wijnaldum in big games when he didn't sort of want him to. But I, I think that I think it's because Jurgen always felt that that was that was not a default. And I, and I remember when they were trying to find uh, sign uh, Fekir, um, and I could see that w- once you lost Phil Coutinho, there was a little bit of that missing against the, you know those eight or nine teams that were going to come to Anfield every year and just shut up shop. You almost needed that, that little bit of extra something that in case the front three couldn't find the space to do it, somebody with, with that. And I think Cater w- was supposed to be that, you know, he had a little bit of pace and could go past somebody. Um, and, and Fekir obviously had a pass and Thiago's definitely got a pass. No doubt about that. And there is, listen, there are some people who I really respect who would have Thiago in the first 11 every single time because of what he adds. It's, it's, I feel a little bit the same about Harvey. I, I think he's a really good footballer. I'm just not quite sure where he fits into Liverpool. That, I, I don't even get rid of him because it, he is. He, he, he does give you something different and not just from the bench. He can start games and, and have a massive... He can be man of the match. But I, I, I when you're playing City or you're playing... Uh, Europa League semi-final or what it's going to be next season. <laughs> I I want three midfield players that are to start the game who who are who are going to yeah go, going to give me what Wijnaldum, Henderson, and Milner did. Finally, then I mean, apart from uh, from the Champions League final, shall we say, in the entirety of your career, what has been the best moment for you? Um. Well, the most important game for me was the 99 final because um, it was the end of the first year after the late great Brian Moore retired. And if I, you know, it's 20 million people watching me, if I'd screwed up that night, we wouldn't be having this conversation now. I wouldn't have been in Istanbul. They'd have got somebody else. Um, but not because I was a United fan. It didn't mean that much to me in that sense. It meant it's more what it meant to me personally, selfishly in my dream job. Um, I... I, I really don't like to, I think football belongs in its moment, and um, which is why going back to the greatest Liverpool 11, you, you can't make an assessment unless you're talking to somebody who remembers seeing little play. Um, because maybe it, they were little pool, you know, then. So, but obviously, he was a different kind of a player to what we've got in the team now because it was a hundred and you know, a thousand years ago. Um, but but football is. It's one of those few things in our lives where we remember where we were when he scored that goal, when that happened, when she scored that goal, whatever. Um, and where we were when we were 20 is somewhat different from where we were when we were 70. You know, we've got different lives, different responsibilities. But football still captures those moments and defines those moments for a, a bit like music or, uh, you know, world events, world tragedies, sadly. Um you remember where you were when whatever. And uh, I think people do remember where they watched 05 or, or if they switched it off, you know, or um, I think, um, yeah, I, 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 it, it, we, 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 as you're aware, we've got this little sort of cottage industry now 
with the commentary charts. And um, the Liverpool commentary charts we've got, uh, which are the prints of the research notes or my season's record of uh, uh, that we publish and frame. We've got 05. We've got both cup finals from last season. We've got a chart which um, records everything that happened in the, the title season. Um, 05 is still the biggest seller. Mm-hmm. And you, how old have you got to be now to 18? So well, I'm, to be, I'm 21 and I don't remember it. You'd have to be so. 30 probably to remember it. Um, yeah. So it is now starting to get a little antique. But then our Southampton chart is the 1976 FA Cup final. It, that Because that that is, you know, that's still the memory for the people that don't have memories of it. Um, and... So my memories, my greatest memories, coming back to the very first question you asked me, are when I was almost part of the team. Um, when my mates were playing in the European Cup final. I, in 81 in Paris, I went with the team to the Lido, the famous review bar just off the Champs-Élysées, and drank champagne from the European Cup. There weren't too many um, freeloaders around on that table that night, but I was one of them because... My mates had won the European Cup. You can't beat that. No. We'll go back to the commentary charts then, Clive, because you'll give, you'll give me one of these before. And uh, this is the Champions League final. I mean, look at the difference in teams. Is ridiculous. I mean, Gerard, you've got a bit of Alonso and Hip here, but the, the team of um, Kaka and Sadoff and Gattuso and Perlo as a midfield four is just absolutely ridiculous. The team, uh, and this, this means a lot to me, this, because. If you if if you can search for these on on Clive's it's, website, what it is is it it it's a, a faithful reproduction of my research notes that were in front of me at kickoff uh, that night. It doesn't tell you what happened. It doesn't. Um, it doesn't. But it does it, tell it you if you do it, know what it tells happened. you. All it is is a screenshot of the start of the match. And so, as a piece of football memorabilia, it's unique in so much you add your own memories. And if you're in Istanbul you can then start to tell the stories of how you got there and how you got back. If you were in the pub, you can remember who you were with. If you were watching it on your own, if you switched it off at half time, you, but, the, but the memories then are yours. So you hang it in your downstairs loo or whatever, and it sits there. And then you start to tell the stories as to why this piece of paper with these names on it means so much to you. And that's, that's the nice thing about, and, and, you know, we've got a, We've done a Luton Town chart for their playoff. I mean, what story is that? That is the end of the most extraordinary journey. And it just sits there and it's just, yeah, it's just the same 11 names and list of substitutes. But it says so, so much more than that. And all of those commentary charts mean something to somebody. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, the, with, yeah uh, hopefully there'll be another Liverpool one before too long. <laughs> we're getting, we're getting that night as well in, in 2005. I mean... You wrote it on the back of my commentary chat saying, oh, hello, hello, here we go. Yeah, I don't know why I said that. It was more, yeah, more hopeful no, judgment. Them, me, I didn't honestly think thought. they were going to come back, no. Honestly, <laughs> yeah, but it, it, that that single sentence to me that night stands out most than, most than anything. It's that Steve Jarrett had an incredible that sense of destiny way. and maybe, you know, we've seen crazier things from Liverpool in the last few months. Um Maybe this is the start of something, um, oh. but and it it was it was a rather it was a clutch of a straw um, to to even think that it might you know here we go whatever uh, and and yeah thank thankfully the players made it come true um, so it, they've made yeah. it iconic they've made that they've made that sentence iconic I think the be- I think the best commentary line of the night is this time it's for keeps um, yeah you yeah. know when the trophy went up and and that's five and. Yeah, this time we get it. Yeah, you is, there any, is there any other commentary no. lines you remember in your past? Then? No, 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 I don't do that. Gone. Come on, I've I've got to go and make some more. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, Clive, it's been an absolute pleasure, and we could speak to you for about three, four hours about everything. <laughs> but um, really, really appreciate your time, um, and make sure to go and check out the commentary charts, which will be in the link in the description. Really appreciate your time, Clive. Thank you. All right then, see you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks, bye, bye, Clive. Bye.